Hello class, welcome back to financial management and we are going to continue on today with chapter six discussing um, bonds and interest. So yesterday I briefly was talking about restrictive covenants. Um, I'm going to continue that on with a little bit more detailed discussion on restrictive covenants and what some different kinds there are that you will see out there. And um, so restrictive, restrictive covenants, um, they place basic restrictions on operating and financial decisions that the company can make. So, and if there are violations, then it can give bondholders the right to demand immediate repayment for their bonds. So some of the co uh, restrictive covenants would do things like requiring that they main adequate cash levels to make sure that they can make their loan payments, um, prohibiting them from selling their receivables, which is called factoring, um, because in the law that might get them more cash in the short term, but often when you sell those receivables, you sell them at a huge discount. So overall, it would lead to a lack of cash in the long run. Um, they might require that they keep certain amounts of fixed assets on hand so they can't sell off their assets to repay things. Um, it can prevent them from borrowing too much other money or um, it, might, um, it might prevent them from subordinating debt on their original loan. So like um, any loans that they might take out after their bonds are sold would have to be repaid after the bonds were repaid. Um, and then it can prevent them from giving extravagant dividends out to the shareholders before they repay their bonds. So um, some other requirements that could be on a bond um, uh, covenant would be what's called a sinking fund where they might have to put a bunch of cash aside um, in order or um, they might have to retire certain bonds at certain points in time. Um, they might have collateral that would get pledged like their inventory um, for a security interest. Uh, and then they might have a, a third party, an, in, an independent third party that would take specified actions to protect the bondholders. So just somebody whose job it is to make sure that the bondholders' uh, interests are properly represented in the decision-making processes. And, and that might be somebody on the board or it could just be, you know, a, a, somebody who's associated, you know, with overseeing payments and, and communications with the company regarding the bonds. So um, one of the things we were talking about was risk. And we talked about how if you have a longer time period, there tends to be um, more risk involved because more things can happen, you know, in 10 years than, you know, say two years. You can predict generally a little bit more what's going to go on in two years than you can in 10 years. Um, so because of this, the longer the bond takes to mature, so the longer the period of time, the higher the interest rate will be. And that reflects as part of that risk premium portion. Um, so, um, and because if you remember, we had our rate was equal to um, the risk-free rate um, plus the inflation premium plus the risk premium. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my video here really quick. So you can see that I just wrote that out, you know, so our overall bond rate is gonna equal that risk-free rate plus the inflation premium plus the risk premium. And that was what we had, we had discussed in the last class session. All right. Um, as far as our offering size goes, the larger the size of the offering will go, the lower the cost will be of the bond. So let's say that we have, you know, a you know, hundred thousand dollar administrative cost for issuing a bond. It just makes sense if you divide that hundred thousand dollars out into a hundred thousand bonds. It's a dollar a bond, as opposed to if you divide it out into ten bonds and it's ten thousand dollars a bond. So um, the, the, the cost per bond goes down as you have a larger number of bonds that you're issuing, okay? Um, now, the greater the default risk, so the greater the risk that a company will not pay it back. So if the uh, company has 
uh, financial conditions that might make them less likely to be able to repay things or they're in a, operating in a more risky environment, then the higher the costs will be um, for, for the issue. And then, um, so the cost of money in the capital market, that the interest rate is the cost of money essentially, is, is how we determine a bond's coupon interest rate. So they look at this and they say, okay, well, what is the prevailing rate and how does our personal situation interact with that? And that will determine you know, what their rate will be that they will have to have as their coupon interest rate. And generally what they're trying to do is match their coupon interest rate pretty close to the rate on the market initially, but then those bonds can get traded subsequently on the market, bought and sold, and that's when you end up with more of the, the changes in bond price based on how their interest rate compares to the prevailing rates on the market. Um, <coughs> some bonds will have a conversion feature, so they could be traded, they could trade the bond in for shares of common stock. There might be a callable feature, um, <coughs> which honestly, oh, I'm coughing, watch out, um, which is included in most corporate bond issues. And um, so basically that just gives the company the ability to buy their bonds back at a call price prior to maturity. So if it's beneficial for them to do that, if their interest rates are that they're paying are higher and interest rates in the market have dropped a lot, um, their bonds um, would be probably selling at a premium, but there might be a point where it's worth it for them to purchase those bonds back um, at a stated price that they have pre-stated so that they can um, maybe reissue some bonds at a lower rate. Now, typically there's going to be a premium price on that call price, okay? So they're going to repay people more than the original par value on the bond. And so if that premium price becomes lower than the market price, then it becomes beneficial for them to, to issue uh, or to take advantage of that call feature. Okay, so typically that call premium is gonna be equal to one year of coupon interest. So that basically pays the person who was holding the bond for, um, for a year's worth of interest. And then, um, so when interest rates fall, as I said, the issuer can refund the issue at a lower cost. Uh, okay, and that's just a review of what I just said. Um, sometimes there's what's called a stock purchase warrant where um, holders can purchase a certain number of shares at a certain price over a period of time. Um, so that would be like, you continue holding on to the bond, but you also get a discount on purchasing additional shares of stock. At a, disc, at a discount. So that's good for the bondholder to be able to buy shares at a discount. It's good for the company because the company gets not only you as an investor through bonds, but also gets you investing in their shares of stock, which means that you're gonna be a larger investor in their company. And, um, and putting those warrants out there allows them to raise more money from you in more ways without um, quite so many additional costs and as much promotion as might be required if you did a totally separate bond issuance, or I'm sorry, stock issuance too. Okay, so when we're looking at bond yields, so when we say yield, we're referring to an interest rate, okay? We've got a current yield, we have a yield to maturity, and we've got a yield to call, okay? So the current yield is um, what you are paying right now for the bond, the yield to maturity is when we look at what you actually paid for the cost of a bond, what is your effective interest rate that you are achieving for that bond from now until the time that it matures based on the interest payments that you're gonna receive. And we're gonna talk about a few different things. We're not gonna really get too much into the yield to call. The ones we're mainly interested in here are the current yield and the yield to maturity. Now. Most corporate bonds are purchased by banks, insurance companies, and other large institutional investors. There are some smaller investors who like to putter around in some bonds, but the large amounts of money that a company brings in are, are from larger investors. 
And so when those are originally issued, they go out at the face value of $1,000 because we're matching the interest rate to what the market requires uh, as the coupon rate when we originally issue those. But then they can get sold by those people and traded on the market after they've been issued. And that interest rate that we had as a coupon rate may not match that that is required by the market after that, okay? And so after that, we restate bonds, rather because bonds get sold at different amounts, like a lot of them are a $1,000 unit, but maybe it's a $500 bond or maybe it's a $10,000 bond or whatever. And because they're purchased in large blocks, people don't really care about like how many actual bonds they are. So what they do is they state them as a percentage of what the face value is, okay? So what they will say is this bond here that, that we're picturing on our screen is quoted at 94.007. So that means that the cost of that bond is equal to 90, uh, what you'd pay for it on the market is equal to 94% of its face value. So if we take that 94.007 here, multiply it times the $1,000 face value, that means the actual price is 940.07. Now, if we have a $100 bond and it's quoted at 94.007, it's selling for $94 and 0.007 cents. Okay, and, um, 0.7 cents rather. If we are selling a bond and it's quoted at 110, then we would take 110% times the price of that bond. And that would tell us what the actual price is on the market. So um, with this particular company, if they say you have a price of 103.143, then you say, all right, well, what's the unit? It's a thousand dollar unit, $1,000 times one, um, 103.143% uh, would give you the price of the bond. So here's a, here's a couple different examples, okay? We've got, um, we're saying that these are, um, we've got some different bonds here. We've got, probably this one is a thousand dollar bond. Probably this is a hundred dollar bond. You can take a stab at that and guess. Um, and here's how they're being quoted, okay? So what's going on here is that when we take this price that is quoted out on the market and we calculate it out to amortize this out to a future value of $1,000, say this is a $1,000 face value bond, that $1,000 face value bond, if its coupon rate is 4.125%, if we take $1,000 and we multiply it times um, 0.04125 to get whatever our payment is gonna be here, we're gonna get 40, I suppose I could've just done that in my head, 41.25 is gonna be what the interest payment is. That interest payment is going to end up being whatever the yield to maturity is times what the person paid for the bond, okay, for the payment at that point in time. But because of the time value of money, that changes over time. So um, the price of this bond on the market is going to be a time value of money function, present value, where we have um, this yield to maturity as our interest rate or the required rate on the market, and um, the number of periods between the time that you buy the bond and when it matures, with a payment equal to the coupon rate times the face value or um, par value of the bond, and then your future value ends up always being equal to the par value of the bond, because that's the amount that has to get repaid at the end. And so in depth, I did an example question of this in, um, in the in-class exercises, and we'll see some more examples of that here also. Okay, 
so this is a discussion of bond ratings here. All right, bond ratings can range anywhere from AAA down to C for Moody's or AAA down to D for Standard and Poor's, where D is basically like you're in default. Um, and under Moody's, um, C is basically you're either in default or, or basically there. And as you get higher and you get up to AAA, then the risk premium goes down. As you get lower on the scale, down to C or D, then the risk premium goes up. So that requires higher interest rates from um, companies that are paying interest. So here's a discussion, okay? Can we trust the people who rate our bonds? So Moody's and Standards and Poor's, um, Standard and Poor's, they make their money by rating bonds. So um, they attach these ratings with the expectation that, um, you know, they're making their own personal judgment of whether these um, bonds will end up getting repaid. And typically higher ratings mean they get repaid. Typically lower rating means that they have higher default rates. But when we were looking at things like the subprime mortgage crisis in 2008, they were giving really high ratings to, to funds that were invested in mortgages that had really no underlying value. They were taking mortgages and slicing them up into little pieces and then making them almost like a stock or a bond. And then they were selling those little pieces out on the market. And because of the way they were divided up, there was really no ability for people who are investing or even for the, um, the companies that were making larger investments to determine the quality of the underlying assets. And so a lot of those when the housing bubble burst just poof disappeared. So um, this can cause some ethical issues because you know the bond raters want money to flow through the system. But on the other hand, they have a they have a reputation that they need to uphold in order for those um, ratings to actually have some kind of meaning, right? So they're motivated to, um, to have a level of trustworthiness. But on the other hand, um, they also want there to be volume of sales going on too, you know, because companies aren't going to pay them to rate their company if they are overly judgmental about how um, they're doing their ratings potentially. So they have to balance the will of the and appreciation of the investors with the companies that they're actually rating. Interestingly, this is not unlike what public accountants have to do as far as audits go, because they need to make sure that financial statements that come out of a system are correct. But at the same time, they need the companies themselves are the ones paying them to do the audit. So they need to balance their relationship with that company with making sure that a, an audit report gets created um, in an adequate manner that uh, expresses the true level of risk involved. Okay, so um, international bond issues, um, there's what's called Euro bonds. Um, those are international borrowers that sell to investors in countries other than the currency in which they're denominated. So, um, and then a foreign bond is issued in a host country, like say, um, the US, but by a foreign borrower, all right? So it's issued in dollars for a foreign borrower, whereas Euro bonds are um, international borrowers sold to various investors in various different companies. And that just broadens the market, more people are able to invest. Okay, so here's a couple different types of bonds. Okay, we could have zero coupon bonds, which have a very low interest rate and they sell at a discount from par. Um, so the investor's return comes from a gain in value of the bond as it gets closer to the time that the bond matures and it would be repaid. So they're sold at a discount and then they're paid back at the face value. So the investors make money not on interest payments that they receive, but by being repaid a larger amount at the end. Um, junk bonds have poor ratings and um, those are often used by riskier growing companies to obtain capital. Uh, floating rate bonds can have changing interest rates depending on how the markets go. Um, there can be extendable notes where you can lengthen out the time and to repayment potentially. And then um, putable bonds 
um, are either redeemed at par um, at specific potential dates, um, or they could be transferred into other debt. Okay, so how do we value a bond? All right, this is kind of the meat and potatoes um, beyond the interest rates here. We're gonna talk about how do we um, value these bonds, all right? So the value of any asset in general is gonna be the present value of its expected future cash flows. So what are the cash flows that we're talking about here? All right, well, we've got, um, first you're gonna have your purchase of the bond. Then we're gonna have interest payments. And then at the end, we're gonna have the repayment of the bond, all right? So those are the cash flows that are associated with these bonds. And then we look at when do they occur, and, um, and then there's the risk that is associated with, which determines what is the required return for a particular bond, okay? So for the purposes of bonds on the market, the required return is generally dictated by the market that they're being sold in, okay? Um, and so we tend to look at either, here's the required return, so what is the price that we would need to pay to achieve that required return using time value of money? Um, so what is the present value that would achieve a given rate of return? This should sound a lot like some of the time value of money questions we've already done. Or um, if we don't know the rate of return, this is what we're paying for this bond on the market as a present value. So what is the effective yield to maturity or interest rate that we are achieving? And this part of the discussion will, will, explain, will relate to um, the second and third in-class exercises that are out on the video that I posted on Monday. Okay, so we've got Celia Sargent and she wants to look at three potential investments, okay? Uh, she's looking at stock in Michael's Enterprises. She's looking at an oil well, which has a stream of cash flows, uh, $2,000 at the end of year one, $4,000 at the end of year two, and $10,000 at the end of year four. And then we've got an original painting that we think we can sell in five years for $85,000. So what do we need to do here? We need to calculate the present value of all three of these particular um, investments here, okay? So how are we going to do that? Well, if we've got stock that's uh, valued at a required return of 12%, um, we have a painting where somebody's going to buy it for 85,000 at the end of five years, and we're going to use for that for valuing that one our risk-free rate of 3%. So that's the the rate that we can get for you know a, a federal investment, a treasury investment, or we can have the three different cash payments from the oil well. Okay, um, those ones are all have certain amounts that we can depend on. Now, another scenario um, that we have is, so the, the original paintings, we think we can sell those for $85,000, but the price in five years could range between $30,000 and $140,000. So this is an, another potential spin on that painting one. And because of the high uncertainty around that, we believe that we would need a 15% return for that particular one. So if we have somebody who's contracted for a known amount at 85,000, there's low risk, so it's a 3% rate we would use. If we do not have that, then we could say, well, we could not contract with that person and we could potentially sell it between 30 and 140,000, but we would need to have, we'd have a higher level of risk because of that level of variability. So what we end up doing here is just turning all of these into a time value of money calculation. And we're gonna walk through how to do each of those here in just a second. Basically though, um, and this is a really, um, this is a really complex way of saying what we already learned about a mixed cash flow essentially um, in our previous chapters, all right? So the value of any asset, so the present value is equal to 
each cash flow divided by one plus the rate to the period of the number of periods, okay, for whatever relevant time period. So in the first time period, it's to the first power, in the second time period to the second power, and so on and so forth. Now, we're not going to get too caught up in there, um, but we can do this manually, um, and we can also do it using our calculators. So if we do this manually, looking at these ones, um, if we've got uh, the stock for Michaels, the annual cash flow is a $300 dividend, and Celia decides that a 12% discount rate is appropriate. So for a stock that is valued in perpetuity, and you don't need to know this part right now, we're going to actually have chapter seven on stock valuation coming up here, but the present value of a perpetuity is equal to the cash flow that you would get, um, your cash flow payment, divided by the rate. Okay, so $300 divided by a rate of 0.12 is $2,500 to value that as a perpetuity. Now, as far as the oil well goes, if we say, well, the oil well has a 20% required return based on, you know, risk associated with the cost of fuel and whatnot, we'd say for the first year, we have a $2,000 payment and we divide that by one plus 0.2 to the first power. The second year, we had a payment of $4,000 divided by one plus 0.2 to the second year. And then the third year, we had $10,000 divided by one plus 0.2 to the fourth. Oh, sorry, it was the fourth year. So there was a gap there between two. You add those three cash flows up and that gives you $9,266.98. If you wanted to do this on your calculator, you could use that cash flow function that we were using um, for net present value calculations. Um, and then you'd have, um, you'd have your um, zero for the initial cash flow. And then for year one, you'd have 2,000. Year two, you'd have 4,000. Year three, you'd have zero. Year period four, you'd have 10,000. And then you'd use that 20% rate to calculate back. Uh, and then as far as the last one goes, we have, um, the painting, we're going to just discount from five years back to um, its current value. So you could do it manually this way, or you could do it based on using your calculator. Future value of $85,000, N equals five. Um, interest rate is 15%. Uh, payment equals zero. Calculate the present value. That'll get you that $42,260.02. So same thing. Okay. So how does this relate to bonds, okay? Well, bonds are a time value of money calculation also, all right? So they're a long-term debt item that's used by businesses. And so we can calculate out, um, we can calculate a present value sale price based on what our required rate of return is. And we can also calculate out what the yield to maturity, the effective interest rate is, um, if we know what the what the purchase price is on the actual market, okay? So let's say we've, uh, most bonds are gonna have a maturity of between 10 and 30 years, and in most cases, they're gonna have a par value of $1,000. Now, for the sake of this chapter, we've got bonds that are valued, or that have a par value of 1,000, and some have 500, and some are 100, and various other things, because we wanna make sure that you're learning how to do the math. But in real life, most of the time, it's $1,000. Okay, so the bond has a specified amount of interest that's paid over a specified period of time, all right? So they say, what does that tell us? We've got an N, all right, a number of periods. Um, we have interest that is going to be paid. That is going to be a payment from a time value of money standpoint. And that payment is always going to be equal to the par value times the coupon rate. So the rate that is stated on the, whoops, we're losing our focus here. Let's see if that'll. There we go. Now we got our focus back, sort of. There. All right. Thank you. All right. So, um, the payment is always going to be equal to the par value times the coupon rate. 
That's what, that's just, that's how bonds work. That's what they pay. N equals the number of periods to maturity. Now that is going to be how many periods are left. So when it's a brand new bond, if it's a 10 year bond, then that would be 10. If you're five years in, then you have five years left. So that N can possibly be changing, okay? Um, your principal amount, so the, the par value is gonna be your future value because that's the amount that has to be repaid at the end, all right? And then um, your, what else do we are? So your present value is gonna be the current sale price which is gonna be negative. And then your interest rate is gonna be your yield or um, the required return. It's, um, they're interchangeable kind of here. So the re required return on the market is what the Okay, sorry, I had a little blip there, but um, you're required, uh, you can't really see the eye on the bottom there, sorry, but um, your interest rate is gonna be your um, yield to maturity or the required return, and that those terms will often, often be exchanged. Um, so the required return on the market is what the yield will typically be, and then this present value will fluctuate on the market in order to achieve the required return that the market is demanding. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my screen share, which turned off when I was, when I got booted out of Zoom there for a second. Okay, so keeping that in mind, um, and then we've already talked about what these mean, these terms here earlier, so I'm not gonna um, beat a dead horse on this, but why would we issue bonds? Um, it's a way to raise money for a business investment, okay? We finance companies that way. The Vikings Stadium is a great example of um, where we have a public-private partnership where a government issued a bunch of bonds to help a private entity build this um, facility, which they deemed to be beneficial to um, people at large. So governments can do this, companies can do this, there's a variety. Now, the basic value here is, here's the, this is the formula here, um, but please ignore this and please just stick to the um, time value of money function here that we are going to run through our um, calculator, all right? Run it on your calculator this way. It's much more reliable. Um, there's much less room for error, but for those of you who are uh, who really like to just understand the mechanics, I do have this out here for you. But I'm just going to skip over this because in theory you have already learned that in your financial accounting. Okay, so let's look at an example here, all right, so that we understand this. We've got Mills Company, they're a defense contractor. They issued in 2016 a 10% coupon interest rate, 10-year bond with a $1,000 par value. So they've got, along with this, um, a contractual right to the interest payments, which are going to be 10% coupon rate times the $1,000 par value, which comes out to be a payment when we're looking at our time value of money calculation. Uh, and we've got the $1,000 um, repayment, which is the future value that you would get at the end of this stream, okay? So the interest rate here um, in that particular calculation we had before, um, this works with this formula here, but don't get confused by this down here. This is relating to the formula. Um, it doesn't really uh, fit with how we've been doing our um, calculations on our calculators, okay? but. Ultimately, what's going on here is this is the stream of cash flows that you're going to see. $100 once a year in interest payment, followed by a $1,000 repayment at the end, okay? Now, assuming that the required, if the required rate of return on the market 
is equal to the interest rate we're paying, then this bond at any point in time on here would sell for $1,000. If at any point in time our interest rate that we are paying is not what the market requires, then the value of our bond on the market will change, okay? And so um, here's a time to step out and look at problem 616 in the um, in-class exercises video here and run through some examples of how to do, um, how to calculate what um, your bond value is going to be. And let's see, I, I don't have that problem right next to me here, but the, you can do this two ways. You can calculate what the effective interest rate is, as we do in the last problem in our in-class exercises, and you can do that if you know that what the um, present value is that you would pay on the market, or if you don't know what the price, present value is on the market, but you know what the required return is on the market, then you can plug in everything else and you can solve for that present value to figure out what the amount is that that bond would sell for. Now, because of this, because in interest rates do fluctuate, it's actually pretty unusual other than when a bond is uh, actually issued, it's unusual for its value to be equal to its actual par value. I mean, it might happen fleetingly depending on market conditions, but um, it typically doesn't stay that way for long. So, um, at, so basically at any time your bond's value is going to be changing on the market and it's usually not going to be selling for its actual par value. So what happens if Mills Company's bonds rose to 12% or fell to 8%? And by that they're saying if the required return on the market was 12%, what would happen to the value of Mills Company's $1,000 bond? Well, if the required return was 12%, so the rate was higher than what they were actually paying for their coupon payments, then the bond would sell on the market for only $887, which is selling at what's called a discount. Now, the interesting thing about this particular price is this price will be the present value if you were to calculate at an interest rate of 12%, um, figuring in payments based on your par value and coupon rate, um, a future value of the $1,000 repayment and the remaining number of periods left, okay? So the bonds automatically reprice themselves so that an investor will achieve the required return on the market. If our bond pays less than the market's required return, our bond will sell for less. If our bond pays more than the required return as it does here. So if we're paying 10 and the required market rate is only eight, our bond will be more, worth more than its $1,000 face value and it will sell at what's called a premium. So if we sell at a premium, we sell at a higher price. If we sell at a discount, we sell at a lower price than our face value. And then if we sell at our face value, then we're selling at par. And that would mean that our interest rate is equal to the prevailing required market rate. And a good illustration of this is to go out and look at those in-class exercise videos. And then here are, on your um, financial calculator, here's the, the exact inputs that would arrive at that. And I suggest running through that and thinking about how that works. So if you look here, um, N was the number of years, 10 years, interest rate is the required rate, not the coupon rate, but the required rate. The payment is equal to the face value times the coupon rate. The future value is the face value that will get repaid. And then we would solve for the present value. Okay, and so what's interesting, um, and this just summarizes it, if the required return is lower than the coupon rate, which means that we are paying more interest, our price goes up. If the required return is higher than the coupon rate, um, which means that we're paying less, then our price will go down. Now, interest rate risk, as far as bonds are concerned, is the risk that interest rates will change and will um, affect the price of our bonds. Rising interest rates are 
a higher concern because that will devalue our bond. The value of our bond goes down the more uh, our paid rate that we're paying for our coupon payments, the lower that gets in relation to the required rate, the bigger that difference, the bigger the gap, the less our bond will be worth. Also, um, as a bond gets closer to maturity, um, our, that N gets smaller when we're doing that calculation. And so the present value will actually converge closer and closer to um, the price on the market. So regardless of whether, let's say that we have here, all right, um, as the timeline goes on, let's just make this as a timeline, all right? And this is our repayment time. So n equals zero. If we start out at n equals 10, we've got 10 years until we have to pay it. If a bond is sold at a premium, the price of that bond is gonna gradually converge upon the par value. If we sell at a premium, it will go down towards the par value. If we um, originally sold at a discount, it will gradually go up and converge with par value. And the reason is because we have fewer and fewer interest payments that are getting made. And so once we have no interest payments left, the uh, present value of our bond becomes the amount that we're gonna be repaid at the end or the face value. And here's actually that same drawing that I just made, basically. So here's where you should work on problem 619. Instead of solving for, um, instead of solving for the present value, they're going to actually give you the market value of the bonds, and then they're, you're going to solve for the yield to maturity, which is your effective interest rate. Okay, so the yield to maturity is the rate of return that investors are gonna earn if they buy a bond at a specific price and hold it until maturity. Um, so that is the effective yield that you are getting based on the price that you paid for that bond. And <clears throat> as we said, excuse me, that yields to maturity will gradually converge closer and closer to the coupon interest rate. Um, if the yield to maturity is less than the coupon, it sells at a premium. If the yield to maturity is greater than the coupon, then it sells at a discount. And this one right here, the 622, is actually part of the homework here. So maybe we'll uh, talk about that either today or on Friday as a group in uh, my class session. And um, from there, we will move on. And I think this just about wraps up here. Um, where we're at here. But that Mills Company bond we were talking about, if it's selling for $1,080 and it has a 10% coupon interest rate with a $1,000 par value, it pays interest annually and has 10 years to maturity, what is the bond's yield to maturity? For that example, our N is going to be equal to 10. Our payment is going to be equal to $1,000 times 10%. Um, which is equal to $100. And our present value is what, we're, is what the selling price is, and we're gonna always enter that in as a negative. So that's the 1,080 market price here. And then the future value, that's always gonna be the par value, which is $1,000. So then all we're doing is computing for our interest rate, and that's going to be our yield to maturity. So I suggest running through this and just um, doing that on your own really quick so you can cement where we're going with this. Now, this is an interesting example here, and it shows what all the cash flows are for the period. Um, we've got 10 years worth of interest on the 10th year, um, we end up repaying um, both the $1,000 for the actual or face value of the bond and the $100 interest payment. So this is just doing this, running this in Excel. And they're using a um, internal rate of return calculation for that. Okay. 
All righty. Um, now, what happens if we're paying this multiple times per year? Um, ignore the formula here, but basically you're just going to be adjusting your N based on the number of payments, okay? And then your payment has to be um, what it has to be a partial year payment. So um, if you're looking at your payment, make sure that you calculate um, based on how many times you're going to pay that per year. So if this is getting paid 10% annually and you're paying half of it, you're paying it every six months, then your payment would end up only being 50, um, but it'd be times two. Okay. And then you're, so you're going to want to watch out for those types of input issues when you're looking at this. Okay, and I'm going to skip the formulas here. This is um, another discussion here. Um, so here's paying semi-annually. This is a, an example of how to do this. Paying semi-annually. Instead of 10 years, we've got 20 periods here, right? Um, and then we've got interest. If it was a 12%, uh, yeah, required rate of return here is 12%. So we've got 6% interest for each period. Our payment is um, going to be the half of the 10% times $1,000. So divide that by two. Our future value stays the same. The face value gets paid off the same way either way. So uh, run that example. Keep that in mind if we have smaller time periods here. All right, so that's it for chapter um, for chapter six. So I'm going to let you guys mull through this. We can, I will be here at 1030 at each of our times, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, to run through questions and discuss things that people are wondering about as far as uh, class and or the content. So have a good day.